Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve the problem Dota 2 Senate, which is an absolute essay of a problem. I've never actually played this video game, so let's go through this real quick. Because this is a really good question to use as an example for me to show you how you can take like a pretty complicated question like this one and really break it down. Because sometimes that is the point of an interview to see how your skills can take like high level requirements like this, which I guess aren't really high level, but these are like problem requirements and they're not exactly spelled out for you in like the easiest to understand way, in my opinion. Like this sentence over here, I had to read it like 10 times for me to understand if this senator found the senators who still have rights to vote are all from the same party, he can announce the victor and decide on the change in the game. Well, I think the easiest thing to do is actually to start with the example. So let's see what we're actually working with here. We're only given a single input string here. And what we're trying to do is return the party that is going to win, I guess, some kind of election or something like that. Who cares what exactly it is? Let's not distract ourselves with those details that are pretty irrelevant to our problem, or at least our solution. And in this problem, we have some R's and some D's. I guess they stand for radiant and dire. Who cares? I don't. As far as I know, we have some R's and D's and we have an input string that is going to be R, D, at least in this example. But we could have some others, maybe R, D, D or D, D, R or, you know, something really long. Now, it's not quite as easy as just counting the number of R's and D's. That would probably happen in like a normal election where here we have three D's and here we have two R's. So D's would win. Unfortunately, it's not quite that simple here. So what are the rules? Well, they are a bit complicated, at least the way it's phrased here. But basically, we're going to iterate through this from left to right. That's very important. They mention that over here, which they again, they don't really tell you we're starting at the beginning of the string. They tell you here the round based procedure starts from the first senator to the last senator in the given order. That's a fancy way of saying start at the beginning of the string and move to the right. But to make it even more complicated, complicated actually, we are actually going to not just iterate once necessarily, we can actually loop around when we're talking about voting. I'll talk about that in a second. But these votes are not traditional votes. So this is the senator that's first going to vote. What do they do? Are they voting for their party? No. Actually, what they're doing here is saying that this person is allowed to remove one of these Ds, any of them, since this guy gets to go first. Let's just remove this one. This R gets to do the same thing, remove a D. Well, I'm just going to remove this one. This D gets to do the same thing, remove some R. I guess I'll just remove this one. So now we are left with an R and a D. So here, are we done? Does it end in a tie? No, actually the game keeps going. Here, we were looping through this from left to right. Now we still have some characters. So here is the part where we loop around and go back to the beginning. We're back to R. This guy gets to make another move. And guess what? All they can do is remove a D. Where's the D? It's right over here. That's what she said, uh, but we can go ahead and remove that. And at this point, clearly there are not any choices left. So for R, we would just go ahead and return radiant. That's kind of the only part of this problem where you actually need to know what the string is. The R stands for radiant, the D stands for dire. So after that, this seems really, really simple. It seems pretty deterministic. There's usually just going to be a single solution, right? We're just going to take every R and just remove a D or something, or maybe skip like a future D and do the same thing for every other D. Well, first of all, it's not quite that simple. There actually is a greedy approach. I'll try to explain the intuition really quickly for that. Whenever we do happen to have a choice, for example, let's just make this string a little bit longer. The idea is that if this R gets to choose a D that we can remove, does it matter if we choose this one or if we choose this one? And it kind of does. We probably want to choose the one that's closest to this R. Intuitively, we'd want to do that because we know we're going from left to right. This guy is going to get a move before this guy. So when we have a choice with this R to remove either this D or this D, we should probably take this one because this one is going to be harder to remove. Remember, to remove a character, we need something to the left of it to actually remove those. Well, technically, we can loop around, but who knows? We might not get another chance. There might not be another R over here to ever remove this D. This guy was our only chance 
And now we don't have one. And this D is going to still remain then. And then this D is going to end up removing this R. And what they end up telling us is that let's assume that each senator is going to play this optimally. So assuming that they play as best as possible, which like this D is supposed to remove the one closest to it, this guy is going to remove the one closest to it so that this guy actually will not get the chance to ever remove an R. So that's kind of the intuition here of why we want to remove sort of the nearest neighbor. Uh, by that, I mean like the for R, we want to remove the nearest D that comes next. Okay, so that doesn't seem so bad. How would we go ahead and code a solution like that up? Well, going character by character, if we find an R, we want to remove the next D character and just continue this character by character. Now, when we say remove, how do we handle that removal? Because we probably don't want to have to actually remove it. That's going to be an O of N operation. We can probably lazy delete it. Basically, we could just have like a variable counting the number of like previous R's or something like that. Then when we come up to a D, maybe we could just skip that one. At least at a high level, you can kind of get a picture of how you could solve this by like keeping counts of R's and D's and having an array instead of just using a string because string operations are almost always big O of N. Converting this to an array will actually make most of those operations O of one, except for the removals. So we will have to keep track of that. The last thing is how do we kind of keep track of this D being able to loop around? Because that's going to be really painful. And if we just keep going in circles and circles and we don't really remove these values, then, you know, if we have to keep going through the entire array so many times, we might end up having like an exponential algorithm. So can we do better than that? And yes, we can. So how do we usually handle removals in O of one time from an array? Well, usually when we remove from the end of it, right, using a stack. So maybe we can get some intuition that a stack will help us. And I know an even better data structure where you can actually also remove from the beginning in O of one. So maybe a queue as well here will help us. So knowing that, let's go ahead and try a queue just because it's more flexible than a stack. But we want to handle the removals. How do we remove from a queue either from the beginning or the end where we can handle the voting here? Like when we go from this R over here, I guess we add it to the queue and do the same thing for the next R over here. And now let's get to the D. Well, this D, we don't want to add it to the queue. So what do we do at this point? Should we just skip it? Maybe we can just check the top of the queue or the end of the queue. And if we see an R, we can use that to remove the D. Well, that wouldn't work because if there's a D over here, and now we're trying to add another D. We're going to see a D here and think that we don't need to remove this. But if there were some previous R's over here, yeah, we actually do need to remove it. So can't just look at the top of the queue. And maybe mixing and matching these R's and D's isn't helpful for us because clearly the relative order of them matter a lot. And this is where you might get the intuition for two Q's or you might not. And that's perfectly fine because you may have never seen this solution before. It's pretty rare. I think the two stacks variation is more common. But here we have two Qs. You can guess one is going to be for the Rs, one is going to be for the Ds. Clearly the relative order of them matter. Let's keep track of the indexes. 0, 1, 2, 3. So let's try this again. Here we're actually going to add 0 to the Q. We know that there was a R at index 0. Next 1, let's add 1 to the Q. Next D, 2, let's add 2 to the other Q. We have another Q now for Ds and a different Q for Rs. Now we have R, let's add 2 to the Q here, or not 2, actually 3. And lastly, let's add 4 to the other Q over here. So these are the Ds, these are the Rs. And now to actually do the simulation, let's start at the beginning of both of these Qs, now that we've kind of separated the Rs and the Ds. Starting at the beginning of the Rs and the beginning of the Ds, let's look at the first value and actually pop both of them. We're gonna pop the zero and the two. And at this point, we kind of know what we should do. We kind of know the rules here. Since R is before the D, R is at index zero, D is at index two. So clearly the R is going to be able to remove this D. This is the first D that shows up. We know for sure because we're starting at the beginning of the DQ. And that's exactly what we were trying to do. Now here is a tricky part. Well, first of all, we know that the D is going to be removed. So here I'm just going to cross out the D. And we actually also popped the zero. So I'm going to remove that as well. But are we going to take that zero and then push it again? 
again to the end or maybe the beginning? What are we going to do here? Well, one thing I want to remind you is that this D can possibly remove the beginning, right? We can loop around, but we haven't really accounted for that in our cues. Like when we look at these two values, three and four, we're definitely not going to say this can remove any possible R's because they're all to the left. So that's where this kind of comes in, where after we pop that, we have visited it. We know it's going to still remain in the queue, but we want the a value to be modified and also the position. So it makes sense to pop this and then just append it to the end. And the new value that we're going to give it is going to be the original index plus n. We're adding this offset of n because we want to add the length so that any value in the array can then loop around and actually not just loop around once, but loop around multiple times. So here, if we added that four, we might, you know, pop that four and then make it into an eight at some point because we're going to keep looping. But that doesn't necessarily mean we're iterating through the array multiple times. Remember, we're only visiting each of these values from the queue at most once, whether we're pushing or popping it, it's always going to be a constant time operation. And we're going to do it roughly big O of N times. We haven't really gone through this entire example, but I've pretty much touched on all the points that I wanted to. I do encourage you to walk through the rest of this. I'll go through a couple more. We're going to pop from the left both of these one and four. Which one is smaller? One. So that's the one we're going to pop, but also re push. We're going to add that offset of N, which is the length here, which is five, which makes me realize that this value here should have been a five. So I'm really sorry about that. But also this value that we just popped was one plus an offset of five. That gives us a six over here. But this four over here was actually removed. And now we end up at the end of our solution. How do you know when to stop? Well, here, one of the queues is empty. That means there's only R's remaining. That means the R's are going to win. And from this example, that does make sense. I think what would happen is this R removes this, this R removes this, and then we're done. I will admit, though, this solution is definitely, definitely not easy to come up. So don't beat yourself up about it if you weren't able to solve it yourself. Now let's go ahead and try to code it up. So the first thing I'm going to do is actually convert the input string into a list. Usually operations on strings are expensive because strings are immutable, but lists are uh, mutable. Like we can change this in O of 1. I'm also going to create two queues that are going to be poorly named D and R for the DQ and the RQ, which is going to be a bit funky to keep saying those because this is DQ and this is what I'm also going to reference has the DQ. But going now to the Senate list, we're going to iterate through it getting the index and the character. We can do that using enumerate in Python and using that character. All we need to check is whether it's an R or a D. And then we can add the index of it to the respective queue. For, so for this one, we add it to the R queue, and this one we add it to the D queue. So now we did the initialization where we set up our queues. Now to actually run the simulation, we're going to continue while both queues are non-empty, because as soon as one of the queues is empty, we know we can stop. And actually, once we know that one of the queues is empty, we can return either radiant or dire, and we can return radiant if R is not empty. We know one of these queues is going to be empty. We have to figure out which one. If R is empty, or rather if it's non-empty, then we return radiant. If dire is, or rather just really the else case, then we return dire. So whichever queue is non-empty, that's the one we're going to return. Well, the string, we're going to return the string. We're not returning the queue. Okay, but now for the simulation, we pop from both queues. So D turn, what was that? Well, we'll get it from the queue, D dot pop left and R turn, R dot pop left. And our question is, which one of these is smaller? Is D turn smaller? If it is, we don't have to pop from the queue because we already really did that. What we have to do if R is smaller is add its value back to the queue, but all the way to the right and make sure to add the offset, which is the length of the Senate. And then we can do a very similar thing in the else case where D has a smaller value. So we'll append to the DQ 
and we will append R turn to the DQ with the offset. And then I think we are pretty much done here. Not a lot of code, but definitely not a simple solution to come up with. Even if you know you're supposed to use a Q, this still isn't easy in my opinion. But let's go ahead and run it to make sure that it works. And as you can see, yes, it does. It's pretty efficient. If you found this helpful, please like and subscribe. If you're preparing for coding interviews, check out neatcode.io. It has a ton of free resources to help you prepare. Thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.